We're back in another Sound of Battle Cry, and today we're going to be talking about a topic which I have entitled Laying on of Hands, Transfer of Authority, or Landmark Baptist Tool of Tyranny. And the reason we're talking about this today is if you have watched the videos before uh, about are there apostles, apostolic succession refuted, and then the one after that, church successionism refuted, um, then you'll understand that this goes in line with those other videos. And, um, you know, so we're talking about this, you know, these doctrines of ecclesiology and, and other types of doctrines that go hand in hand with Baptist landmarkers, Baptist briders, and there's a lot of overlap between them and the Catholic Church. And we talked about, you know, the apostolic succession, about how they say that, you know, the Catholic Church teaches they can trace their churches uh, all the way back to the Apostle Peter. And the same thing, you know, there's the same similar type of apostolic succession with the Baptist Briders. And then also there's other people that call themselves apostles today. We refuted that. And then with church successionism, again, there's an overlap where the Catholic Church, Orthodox churches say that they can trace, trace their churches all the way back to the time of the Apostles. And the Baptist landmarkers, Baptist Briders, say the same thing. And they say that you are not a legitimate church unless you do have this lineage and you do have proper authority, which comes from your church being planted by another church with proper authority. And this traces back in this genealogy back to the time of the Apostles. And so, you know, how this next teaching ties in with that, the laying on of hands, is this is actually um, practiced by Baptist writers and landmarkers. And what they do is they say that, you know, in order to transfer this authority, to give you this authority, so that you can, you know, have proper authority to plant a church and do all these things, we have to lay hands on you. Okay, so I'm going to go through that, the laying on of hands, what that means exactly. And, you know, these, these again, these practices are done in other places in the Catholic Church. They lay hands on people and say that there is a transfer of authority, among other things. So let's get into this, read the introduction, and you're, you're going to start to see what I'm talking about here. Those who teach Baptist succession, uh, church successionism, as most Baptist writers and landmarkers do, teach that the doctrine of laying on of hands imparts imparts authority to someone who has been I'm sorry which has been handed down from the church to church all the way until the apostles and even John the Baptist that's why they have the song John was a Baptist and I'm a Baptist too no they don't I don't think those guys are uh, landmarkers but it kind of fits in with my teaching this authority is, is supposedly given to a man through the laying on of hands so that he may become a pastor and then, one, have authority to lay hands on other men to ordain them to the ministry. Number two, have authority to start or plant a church. Number three, have authority to execute the ordinance of baptism. Number four, have authority to execute the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. This authority is said to go all the way back to the apostles. It is apostolic authority, just like Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, has apostolic succession. Okay, so that's what they teach. That through this laying on of hands, they give authority to ordain people to ministry, to plant a church, to execute the ordinance of baptism. And because they say, we'll do a separate teaching on baptism, I'm probably going to take more than one. But they say that your baptism is not a legitimate baptism unless it is done by a man with proper authority. And the man with proper authority to baptize you is a man who had hands laid on him by a man with proper authority. And that man had hands laid on him by another man with proper authority. And you go back in the lineage of successionism. And that's how it works. Okay? But it's done through the laying on of hands. Now, what, now let's get to the proof text, because they always have proof text, right? What is the biggest verse or verses used to prove this doctrine? Well, it's found in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's read that. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to, unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, 
and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Okay, and now, you know, they say these are the foundational principles. Some of them say that, you know, these, the people that fought, the Baptists that follow these were called six principled Baptists, primitive Baptists, whatever it may be. And they say that they follow these foundational doctrines. Now, we know what repentance, faith, resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment are. There's not much argument there. Uh, you know, obviously, there, you know, there has been some argument about re what repentance means in the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement. I have multiple teachings on that. So you can go back and watch those. I have three teachings on repentance, and uh, I talk about that. But for the most part, these things are, you know, pretty much settled. There is, however, disagreement about the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands. We will skip talking about baptism in depth for now, right? We're not covering baptism today, but another day we will. And we're going to be covering laying on of hands. Okay, so that leaves us with it when it says, and of laying on of hands. So they take that from this passage. So let's make a, a, a few points about this. A couple points right away. Let's make two points right away. Number one, there is no explanation here whatsoever as to what is meant by laying on of hands. Right? So if you look in, the, in this passage, it just says, you know, Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doct uh, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands. And it just lists all these. It says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, not laying again the foundation, and then it lists all these doctrines. But it doesn't explain what it means and what it's referring to. So right away, that's a point. Number two is... Laying on of hands is used for different reasons in the Bible. These include to bless someone. Old Testament patriarchs did it. Jesus did it to children, etc. To impute sin to someone, like the scapegoat. To heal someone, which Jesus did. The apostles did. And churches are told to do today, but not in the same way as the apostles. To give spiritual gifts as the apostles did, and also to ordain. We are not told which type of laying on of hands is meant here. Not told. Ordination is assumed. Okay? So they say this laying on of hands only refers to ordination. That's what they say in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. In verse 2, they say laying on of hands refers to laying on of hands for ordination. To ordain someone to the ministry. Now, they're assuming that that's what it refers to. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the different examples in Scripture of laying on of hands before making the third point. Okay, because I just briefly mentioned some of these. But we're going to look in the Bible at when laying on of hands was done and see that there, first of all, were many different times and reasons that laying on of hands was done. So let's do that study, and then we'll look at what we're going to do is we're going to make the third point, and we're going to look at, to back this up, not only Scripture, but we are going to look at some Baptist historians and what they had to say about laying on of hands and about this laying on of hands in the passage of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, and we're going to see what Baptist historians had to say about the usage of laying on of hands in ordination. All right, so we're going to get to that. Let's get into the, the Bible study. Let's look at different examples in Scripture of laying out of hands before making the third point. So here are different uh, reasons laying out of hands was done. First, for imputing sin to a substitute, the scapegoat. This is found in Levit Leviticus chapter 16, verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place... And the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all the, their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat into the wilderness." Okay, so in verse 21 it says, he shall, Aaron shall lay both his hands 
upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. That was one reason laying on of hands was done. To impute sin, to confess sin and, and impute it to the scapegoat. Let's move on to the next reason. Laying on of hands was done for imputing sin to a sacrifice. Let's read in Numbers chapter 8, verse 12. Numbers 8, 12 says, And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks, and thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for the Levites. Okay, so again, laying on of hands was done. Why? Upon the heads of the bullocks, and the one, uh, and thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt. So this was imputing sin to the sacrifice, and they did laying on of hands when they did this. Next, for blessing someone. Uh, and then we're going to look at Old Testament and New Testament when this was done. The uh, laying on of hands for a blessing. Uh, in Old Testament, as part of a birthright and in general for, for blessing. We'll read in Genesis chapter 48, starting at verse 13. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim and in his, in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. Okay, so this was done for a blessing in the Old Testament. Laid hands, uh, he stretched out his right hand, laid it upon Ephraim's head and on Manasseh's head. All right, let's move on to the New Testament. Blessing in general for the laying on of hands. All right, let's look in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. And they brought young children to him, to Jesus, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and put his hands upon them, and blessed them. So again, Laying on of hands was done to bless. Jesus did it to the children. It was done in the Old Testament. This was a common practice. And it had nothing to do with ordination. Let's continue. Laying on of hands was done for healing. And we'll look at different, uh, multiple examples of that happening. Luke chapter 4, verse 40. Jesus did it. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them okay jesus laid his hands on them and healed them and the apostles did the same thing laid their hands on people and they healed them mark chapter 16 verse 17 and 18 and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, just a quick note. Some people say that this, you know, this is supposed to refer to all Christians today. But um, please go back and watch my video that I did called Are There Apostles Today? And I show that there are no apostles today that no one can meet the qualifications of an apostle. They, do, they were, um, after they died out, there were no more apostles. There's only 12 apostles' names in the foundation of New Jerusalem, and there's no more. And that these signs were ones that followed the apostles, laying hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And if someone claims to have that power today, then I suggest they go down to their local hospital and heal everyone there and empty that place right now. All right, but let's continue. So they lay hands on the sick and they recovered. And then Acts 28, 8, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Again, laying on of hands for healing. But now the Bible says the elders of the church are to anoint the sick with oil and pray for them. Right, exactly. 
And there's nothing wrong with that if someone wants to do that today. James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. So it says the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It does not say the laying on of hands by the pastor with apostolic Baptist authority shall save the sick. The emphasis is on prayer, not the anointing of oil or the laying on of hands. Not in people having special power, special oil, whatever it is. It's from the power of God. Okay, let's continue. Laying on of hands was done for the imparting the Holy Ghost to someone. This is something that happened with the apostles. Acts chapter 8, verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the, apostles, on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So Simon the sorcerer thought he could buy this power, but the power was what? They laid their hands on people and the Holy Ghost was given. He said he saw that. Uh, uh, they, it says that he saw that and he wanted to buy it. But he got rebuked for it. Okay, so that's another reason laying on of hands was done. This gift of God was only given to the apostles, right? It says through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Okay, not just anyone. Here's another one for imparting spiritual gifts. Laying on of hands was done. Acts chapter 19, verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Okay, so, again, Paul the Apostle lays hands on them, and they spake with tongues, they, and they prophesied, they had spiritual gifts, imparted spiritual gifts. And only, again, only the Apostles had this gift to impart, not something that is done today. Next point, laying on of hands was done to appoint someone for a specific task or ministry. This was done specifically by the apostles. Okay, and this is where they really try to twist some things, but I'll address all that in a, in a little bit. Uh, Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye, out among ye, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Okay, so they had them to help them, serve them, to uh, deal with the widows. It says the widows were neglected. And the apostles said, we don't have time to go help the widows. We need to be praying and, and dealing with the ministry of the word, preaching and teaching the word of God. We need uh, some help in this matter. So they appointed these men to a specific ministry. And when they did that, they prayed and laid hands on them. Now, this doesn't mean this needs to happen every single time something like this you know, happens today. This was something that happened with the apostles. And uh, again, I'll cover more about that later. Let's move on to another one. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia 
and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Okay, so again, what, what are we talking about here? To appoint someone for a specific task or ministry, and this was done by the apostles. Now, the Holy Ghost is the one that said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. They being sent forth by the Holy Ghost for this specific task, for this work. And it says they fasted, they prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So this isn't something that we go, oh, okay, well, we need to do that exact thing today because this is during the time of the apostles and it was done for a specific task. It doesn't mean that this is something that needs to be replicated today that we have to lay hands on people, okay? Because we don't have anything in our hands to give. Okay, now we're getting into ordination. Let's get into that. Really dig into the meat of that. Since we've seen that laying on of hands can be used in many different ways, right? So for you to assume in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, that laying on of hands only refers to ordination, uh, you're making a lot of assumptions there. And let's hammer that some more. What about laying on of hands for ordination? Okay, well, let's look at some passages about that. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Okay? So this is another proof text that is used to say, well, we need to lay hands on people. Right? Neglect not the gift that is in thee, the gift of the ministry. And they say this refers to ordination. Well, let's look at it. A gift was given by the laying on of hands. We know only the apostles could do this, and no one can do this today. It also says by prophecy, and prophets existed back then, which may have foretold this about Timothy. Presbytery just means elders. Paul was among these elders, as we see in the next verse. There is no reason to believe it wasn't all apostles that laid hands on Timothy. Why? Why do you assume that it wasn't apostles? And again, that's the thing with these Baptist writers, with these specifically landmarkers, is they act like they're apostles in many different ways. That's why we talk about apostolic succession, church successionism, all this stuff. The authority that they claim, they claim to have the same authority as an apostle. They're usurpers. They're usurping, usurping authority that does not belong to them. They don't really have it, but they pretend to. Okay? And they use these proof texts that apply to the apostles and applying it to themselves. There's no reason to believe it wasn't all apostles that laid their hands on Timothy. Now look at the next verse. 2 Timothy 1.6 Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Whose hands? Paul the Apostle. Okay? So, in 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, with the, that was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. But then in here, 2 Timothy 1.6, he says, Stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands, Paul the Apostle. So, this presents a problem to the landmarker because the gift being imparted to him is being imparted by an apostle. There are no apostles today, and that special ability to give a gift through the laying on of hands was only given to apostles, not to a pastor today. Paul said, my hands. He also repeated that the laying on of hands imparted a gift of God. That power is only given to apostles. Let's look at the next verse, which is used again by landmarkers. 1 Timothy 5.22 Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Timothy and Titus were the direct disciples of the Apostle Paul. Timothy was given authority by Paul 
to lay hands on men for ordination into the ministry during this time of laying the foundation of the churches. This gives no commandment for a perpetual observance of the laying on of hands for ordination. The principle that men should not be made pastors hastily without first being proved holds true today. Absolutely it does. But this laying on of hands does not impart any special authority or gifts. Okay? There is nothing wrong with saying that, you know, with the spirit of this verse. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Which means, you know, do not have someone ordained to the ministry that uh, very quickly, hastily, without them first being proved. You know, it talks about in, uh, when it talks about the qualifications of a bishop and of a deacon, it says let, with the deacon, let these also first be proved. So when there is a time to ordain, which by the way is through a vote of the congregation, when it's time to ordain a pastor or a deacon to that office, there should be a time of proving before to show that they meet the qualifications and that of good moral character in the case of a pastor that they're apt to teach these types of things and after the period of proving then the congregation can vote to uh, ordain them to the office of a bishop so it it shouldn't be something that's done hastily 100% but that doesn't mean we need to perpetually observe this thing where we need to lay hands on people to put them into the ministry. There's no imparting of any authority or gifts with the laying on of hands. Now, let's read some quotes about this. So you see that uh, I'm not just coming out with some new doctrine that has no historical context, that this is something new, and, and, and that I'm not departing from Baptist belief throughout history as well. I'm not. In fact, the landmarkers are the ones that are coming up with some something, again, that is following people like J.R. Graves. And they act like, oh, this is the, the standard Baptist belief that everyone should practice. It's not true at all. So let's read a few quotes. First, we'll read one by John Gill, who was a Baptist. It was only through the laying on of hands of the apostles that the Holy Ghost was given. Philip, an evangelist, laid not hands on the believing Samaritans, but Peter and John, apostles, were sent down from Jerusalem to Samaria to do it, whereby many received the gifts of the Holy Ghost, fitting them to take the care of those new converts and to spread the gospel further in those parts. Acts 8, 5. And since gifts have ceased from being conveyed this way, the right of laying on of hands in ordination seems useless and of no avail. John Gill. He said the the right of laying on of hands in ordination seems useless and of no avail. There's no point of doing it. All right. Now let's let's see what John Gill the Baptist actually had to say about Hebrews chapter 6 verse 2. We talked about that. That's used a lot to say oh laying on of hands in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 2. That's referring it has to refer to ordination. Well, let's look at it. He said, The foundation of this was to be no more laid, nor the doctrine of it to be any longer taught and learned in the way that it had been. For not the right, but the doctrine of laying on of hands is here intended. Okay, do you understand what he's saying here? He says, not the right, but the doctrine. The right of laying on of hands means, oh, we need to, you know, the foundational doctrine of laying on of hands means this is this right that we should continue to practice. But he's saying, no, it's referring to the doctrine, understanding what laying on of hands means and how it's been used all throughout the Bible. And it has no reference to the right of laying on of hands by the apostles, either in private persons or officers of churches. For what was the doctrine of such a right? It's not easy to say, but to the right of laying on of hands of, of priests and of the people upon the head of sacrifices, which had a doctrine in it, even the doctrine of the imputation of sin to Christ, the great sacrifice, it was usual with the Jews to call the imposition of hands upon the sacrifice, simply laying on of hands. Right, that's exactly what I showed. All throughout the Bible, there was 
there were these instances where the Jews laid their hands on the sacrifice to impute the sin to the sacrifice, and that was laying on of hands. And they understood by it the transferring of sin from the persons that laid on hands to the sacrifice on which they were laid, and that thereby, as they express it, sins were separated from them, and as it were, put upon the sacrifice. But now, believers were no longer to be taught and learned the great doctrine of the imputation of sin by this rite and ceremony, since Christ has been made sin for them and has had sins imputed to him and has bore them in his own body on the tree. Right. And we understand that that was a type and a shadow when they put their hands on the sacrifice of what Jesus Christ would do. Because Jesus Christ had our sins imputed to him and then he was punished for our sins in our place. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the imputation is, in Isaiah 53, it says also, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the imputation of sin. And so after that, there was no more, it was no longer necessary to do the laying on of hands to sacrifices. The following quote is from John Gill's Complete Body of Practical and Doctrinal Divinity about the tradition of laying on of hands for ordination. Okay, so let's see what he had to say here as well. One more quote from uh, John Gill. He gives um, five quick points against laying on of hands for ordination. Bishop, okay, point number two. Though there was a stretching out of the hands, yet there was no imposition of hands used at the ordination. One, Christ ordained the twelve apostles himself, but we read not a word of his laying his hands upon them. See Acts 1, 22-26. Point number two, the apostles are said to ordain elders in every church, not by the laying, laying their hands upon them, but by taking the votes. Titus 1, 5, okay? And that is the manner which is congruent with Baptist history, is that you take up the vote at the time of ordination. And um, point number three, no instance can be given of hands being laid on any ordinary minister, pastor, or elder at his ordination. Number four, the hands of ministers being now empty, they have no gifts to convey through the use of this rite. Exactly, because the pastors now are not apostles. And number five, to say that this rite is now used at the ordination of a pastor to point him out to the assembly is exceeding trifling and is a piece of weakness for which no excuse can be made. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, John Gill was pretty clear right there about how he felt about this rite of laying on of hands. He said there's, there's no point in doing it. It doesn't do anything. But the landmarkers would tell you, oh no, you cannot be a, a pastor unless you come to me and I lay my hands on you and send you out so that I can transfer authority, apostolic authority, to you. That's what they say. And it's through the laying on of hands. All right, let's get uh, read this other quote from uh, Albert Barnes. And he wasn't a a Baptist, but he had some good quotes right here. And then right after that, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to read from Thomas Armitage, Baptist historian. That'll be the last quote I read. And man, he's got a great quote about this as well. All right. So quick quote from Albert Barnes. The true doctrine respecting the design of the laying on of hands is said here to be one of the elements of the Christian religion. That the custom of laying on of the hands is symbolical of imparting spiritual gifts prevailed in the church in the time of the apostles. No one can doubt. But on the question whether, whoops, on the question of whether it is to be regarded as a perpetual obligation in the church, we are to remember a few points here, four points. Number one, that the apostles were endowed with the power of imparting the influences of the Holy Spirit in a miraculous and extraordinary manner. It was with reference to such an imparting of the Holy Spirit that the expression is used in each of the cases where it occurs in the New Testament. Point number two, the Savior did not appoint the imposition of hands of a bishop to be one of the rites or ceremonies to be observed perpetually in the church. The injunction to be baptized and to observe this, his supper is positive, absolutely. 
Baptism and the Lord's Supper, very clear that it should be kept. And it is universal in its obligation, but there is no such command respecting the imposition of hands. It's not there. We don't have that command for the laying on of hands. Point number three, no one now is entrusted with the power of imparting the Holy Spirit in that manner. There is no class of officers in the church that can make good their claim to any such power. What evidence is there that the Holy Spirit is imparted at the right of confirmation? He's talking about, you know, this Catholic stuff. Point number four, it is liable to be, to be abused or to lead persons to substitute the form for the thing or to think that because they have been confirmed that therefore they are sure of the mercy and favor of God, right? Talking about confirmation and, and, and you know, Protestants picking that up. But anyways, point is, there is no scriptural command for the laying on of hands, okay? Something that does not need to be practiced. And it's liable to be abused. Oh yeah, it absolutely is abused. It's a use, that's why I called it, you know, Landmark Baptist tool of tyranny because they say, you cannot be a pastor unless you come to me and I lay my hands on you and then give you that special authority. Without that, you're not real. You're fake. You don't have proper authority. You're not striving lawfully unless you come to me and let me lay my hands on you. All right, let's continue. Now moving on to Thomas Armitage, last quote. Thomas Armitage, Baptist historian from his book, A History of the Baptists. And if you watch my last video, which is uh, church successionism refuted and perpetuity of the church defended, I talk about how the perpetuity of the church and, and the succession of the church yeah, are two different things. And that scripture teaches a perpetuity of, of the institution of the church. That in every age there would always be true New Testament churches all the way until Christ returns. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's 100% true. And there always have been true churches even before the Protestant Reformation that were separate from the Catholic Church. There always has been. But that is not the same as church successionism which says that there is some unbroken line, church after church, planting churches, laying hands, tracing baptism after baptism, pastor after pastor in succession. There does not need, there is no uh, evidence that can be proved of that and there is no need for that. So it's two different things. Now, in the last teaching I showed that Thomas Armitage was against that, he spoke against it, but he proved perpetuity of the church with his book and now in here, you're going to see what he had to say about laying on of hands and ordination. And there's some interesting uh, comments on ordination in here too. So definitely something to uh, take a look at. All right, let's get into it. From um, this section, I'll talk about this section at the end, but it's section number three. Each of the apostolic churches elected their own pastors directly in the exercise of their free suffrage. This they did by stretching forth their hands as the sign by which they cast their vote, as many deliberative bodies now cast their vote by the uplifted hand. This was the power of ordination, which was lodged in the local church, which ordination consisted in their election. Okay, So stretching forth of the hand is not the same as laying on of hands. They didn't touch anybody, but you know it's the same thing. We take up a vote and you say, you know, all in favor say aye, and people raise their hands. That's it. It's just talking about voting. And uh, the congregation voting is what happens at ordination. In the apostolic churches, ordination did in no way consist in the laying on of hands. Okay? So right away, he's talking against this. Ordination did in no way consist in the laying on of hands. For the appointment of a man to be to the pastoral office was his ordination with or without this. The laying on of hands was often connected with the setting of anyone apart for office or for a special service, but not always in either of these cases. Our Lord ordained his apostles, but not by the laying on of hands. He says the same thing as well. He didn't. He observed this form when he healed the sick and blessed little children. We covered that. Because both these acts couched a special benediction. For the same reason, it accompanied the bestowment of supernatural gifts 
as when Peter and John laid their hands on the Samaritan believers and they received the Holy Ghost. I covered that. And as when Timothy received the same gift given through the prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership, 1 Timothy 4.14, we covered that. So Paul, who had long been an apostle and had preached the gospel abundantly, received the laying on of received the laying on of hands at Antioch not to induct him into the gospel ministry. See that? But into a special missionary work on a special missionary journey. Because Paul, the apostle, was put into the ministry by Jesus Christ. And he said when he first got saved, he wasn't even discipled by any, he didn't go and see any apostles. He was directly with Jesus Christ, learning from him for three years in the Arabian desert. But into a special missionary work, special missionary journey. Acts 13, 2 and 3. Dr. Hackett says in this passage, Paul was already a minister and an apostle. See Galatians 1, 1. And by this service, he, at, he and Barnabas were now merely set apart for the accomplishment of a specific work. And that's another point that I covered when they did that laying on of hands at that time. They were summoned to a renewed and more systematic prosecution of the enterprise of converting the heathen. All right, so let's move on. Next point. Again, sometimes the laying on of hands was attended by prayer and sometimes was not. But in time, it became subject to abuses in common with other apostolic practices, some of which have continued unto this day. It became, yeah, exactly. It's abused. As I said, laying on of hands is used as a tool of control. That's how it's abused. It became in post-apostolic times an efficacious accompaniment of baptism, of the supper, of the restoration of the excommunicated, and of the ordained to the work of the ministry. In fact, it was perverted, made a superstitious and sacerdotal act, and Cyprian did not scruple to say of the baptized what the hierarchy now says of ordination. Receive the Holy Ghost through our prayer and the laying on of our hands. When hands were laid on deacons and elders or on men set apart for any special work, it was the sign of their appointment only. Not that it was uh, conveying any, you know, transferring authority. The fullest, clearest, and most reliable account known to the writer setting forth this whole matter is from the pen of the learned Dr. Gill and may be profitably quoted here. So even... <laughs> Even Thomas Armitage quotes uh, John Gill from his book, uh, Body of Divinity, chapter 3, page 246. So here's another good quote from Gill on this. The essence of ordination lies in the voluntary choice and call of the people and in the voluntary acceptance of that call by the person chosen and called. Okay, so it's voluntary choice and call of the people, the congregation and the voluntary acceptance of that call by the person chosen to call, the person called to preach. Okay? It involves both. For this affair must be by mutual consent and argument with the congregation and the preacher, which joins them together as pastor and people. And this is done among themselves, and public ordination, so-called, is no other than a declaration of that. Election and ordination are spoken of as of the same, the latter is expressed by the former. Paul and Barnabas are said to ordain elders in every city or to choose them. That is, they gave orders and directions to every church as to the choice of elders over them. For persons sometimes are said to do that which they give orders and directions for doing. And here's some examples. As Moses and Solomon with respect to building the tabernacle and temple. Even though they gave orders to other people doing it, they were said to do it. Though done by others, and Moses particularly, is said to choose the judges. Exodus 18, 25. The choice being made under his direction and guidance. Okay, saying the same thing. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. Chose them uh, who should be ordained. Gill further says of elections in the apostolic churches. Check this out. Listen to this quote. This choice in ordination in primitive times was made two ways. By casting lots and by giving votes, signified by stretching out of hands, not laying on of hands. Ordinary officers as elders and pastors of churches were chosen and ordained by the votes of the people. Okay, ordained by a vote of the congregation. 
expressing by stretching out of their hands. Thus it is said of the apostles, Acts 14.23, when they had ordained them elders in every church by taking the suffrages and votes of the members of the churches, shown by the stretching out of their hands, as the word signifies, in which they directed them to, and upon it declared the elders duly elected and ordained. But he explicitly denies that there was any imposition of hands used at the ordination of elders or pastors in apostolic times in these words. One more quote from Gill. No instance can be given of hands being laid on any ordinary minister, pastor, or elder at his ordination, nor indeed of hands being laid on any upon whatsoever account, but by extraordinary persons, nor by them upon any ministers, but extraordinary ones, and even then not at and for the ordination of them. Okay, so Gill very strongly talked against laying on of hands in ordination. Now, Thomas Armitage continues the last paragraph here. He also claims that whatever gift was bestowed upon Timothy, no office was bestowed upon him either by the laying on of hands of Paul or of the presbytery. Okay, that's an important distinction. Uh, no office was bestowed upon him by laying on of hands. I want you to see that distinction. But that the whole proceeding was extraordinary. He further deprecates the practice as needless at the present day and as a weakness. We already read that quote. This, however, he gives as a mere opinion in view of the abuses to which the imposition of hands has been subjected. It was abused, even among Baptists as well. Uh, and one Baptist who advocated for this was um, Thomas Grantham, who uh, believed that you could, he believed in conditional security, that you could lose your salvation, and was accused by some of actually being a Jesuit. I haven't looked into that, so I can't say anything about him, but I'm just saying that was someone who said that. That doesn't mean that it was, you know, it was prevalent among all of the Baptists, but there was that practice there. And it was abused, and it's abused today. And, and, beca and, and here's the thing, before I finish this paragraph, the reason that I'm doing this teaching is I have seen firsthand this teaching used to abuse and control people. And as a, as a, as a tool of um, tyrannical usurping of authority to prevent people from being able to go into the ministry unless they come to people who supposedly have proper authority and they need to be laid, have their hands laid on them. Um, this, however, gives me your opinion, a view of the abuses, okay, and add not as an authoritative utterance based on the requirements of Scripture. However, Thomas Armitage says, in keeping with these views, however, the English Baptists have never held councils, nor as a custom, used the imposition of hands for the ordination of men to the ministry but have left the whole matter in the hands of the church, which calls a man to this work, a prerogative which Christ lodged in that church, and which all the churches on earth cannot remove. Okay, so that's from Thomas Armitage's book, A History of the Baptist, from the chapter of the New Testament period, The Apostolic Churches, The Only Model for All Churches, Section 3. If you want to go read that yourself, go ahead. You can read all that that I just read. Okay, so again... We got a, a couple Baptists here, Baptist historian, speaking against this laying on of hands and everyone giving all their arguments against it. I think we see pretty clear from Scripture that, you know, you, you at bare minimum, cannot just assume that Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2 is referring to laying on of hands and ordination. And just to assume that is absolutely crazy. Now the last point, number point number three. And this, this, this is where I'm going to put the nail in the coffin about that Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. Point number three. These six principles are called the foundation. Now think about this. Every Christian repents of dead works, puts their faith in God, gets baptized, both spiritually and with the ordinance of water baptism, right? You, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost at salvation, and you are, and then there's the ordinance of water baptism, which usually people are baptized after salvation. That's something that all Christians partake of. They will be resurrected one day with a new body and they will all stand before God 
on the day of judgment one day, judgment seat of Christ, right? So every Christian takes part of that. But what about the laying on of hands? Every Christian usually learns about these doctrines as foundational truths of salvation and the Bible. As for laying on of hands, if it only means ordination, certainly not every Christian will be ordained into the ministry, will they? Will they? Answer that, landmark Baptists. If these are foundational truths for every Christian, we see, obviously, those other five make sense for all Christians, but what about the laying on of hands? How is that a foundational doctrine for every Christian if it only means laying on of hands at ordination? How then can we say this is a foundational doctrine for every Christian? Um, that would not make any sense. This would be forcing a definition on this text just to fit the narrative of your theology, of landmarkism. That's all you're doing. Twisting the scripture to fit your theology. And one final point. Most, of, most all of the other proof texts used all come from the book of Acts. All come from the book of Acts. Now, why is that significant? Well, the book of Acts is a transitional book of laying of the foundation of the church. That's why. Paul, now let me give you one example. Paul circumcised Timothy in the book of Acts, but then later said in Galatians, if you be circumcised, Christ profiteth, shall profit you nothing. Did you know that? Paul circumcised Timothy in the book of Acts just because he didn't want to be harassed by the Jews. That's it. But then later in, in Galatians, he said, no, you don't need to be circumcised. Christ will profit you nothing if you're circumcised. You don't need to be circumcised to be saved. So when you take things out of the book of Acts and try to make that as the standard doctrine that all Christians should follow today, you're on very shaky, dangerous ground. And you know, those that get most of their proof text up from the book of Acts, let me give you a few examples. Hebrew Roots, Charismatics and Pentecostals, Hyper Dispensationalists, Church of Christ who believes in baptismal regeneration, infant baptism, and many other cults. These groups always want to take the special or transitional things of the apostles, uh, transitional things the apostles did for themselves and apply it to themselves now. They always want to do that. They want to lift out certain things out of the book of Acts and say, oh yeah, everyone needs to do that now. That applies to us now. When it's a transitional book from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from there were, you know, laying the foundation of the church, a time when the apostles were on the earth doing miracles. And they want to take these verses out of there and say, oh yeah, this is what we all need to do today. Even though we have clear teaching from the New Testament, from Romans to Revelation, that you can clearly see in light of all those other epistles, if you look at the book of Acts and you go, okay, now I understand, for instance, like I said, okay, why did Paul circumcise, have Timothy circumcised? Well, because later he says, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So then you go, okay, well, he clearly says I don't need to be circumcised to be saved. Then I need to figure out why he had Timothy circumcised. And then you can study it out and you understand, okay, this is a transitional time. There were Judaizers everywhere that were harassing them and he's just getting them off his back. That's it. And then when you understand that, you see, okay, this isn't something that's supposed to be a perpetual pra uh, practice that we're supposed to practice today, and as part and because there's, uh, it's clearly spoken against uh, in plain scripture in the New Testament. Okay, so that's just one example fr from the Hebrew roots, but it applies to the landmark Baptists. They say, "Oh, look at look at all the Book of Acts. They're ordaining elders in every city. They're laying hands on them, and they completely ignore the context. They and they take it from this transitional book." And they apply it to themselves today because they're acting like apostles. And it just so happens to be that a lot of these guys have massive egos filled with pride. And they kind of want to be like an apostle. And they want you to treat them like an apostle.
and they want loyalty. Oh yeah, absolutely, 100%. They have cults of personality. And if you're not loyal to them, ooh, watch out. They'll preach sermons against you. As soon as you show any signs that you're not 100% submitted to them and loyal to them, they'll preach uh, sermons against you. They won't use your name, but they'll talk about you, preach sermons against you, throw you out of their churches, lie about you, attack you, slander you to everyone that goes to the church there so they all uh, have evil surmisings against you. That's what they do. Because they are usurpers. They don't have real authority. It's fake. It's a house of cards. It doesn't exist. It's an illusion. And I pray to God that anyone that's caught up in this stuff sees through the illusion now. It's not real. You don't have to go to them to get your hands laid on by them to have them lay their hands on you. You don't need their authority to have true baptism, to be ordained into the ministry, to, to have a, a, a true church. You don't have to come to them. You don't have to travel from Africa to, to America to get special authority to char start a church. It's all lies. It's all lies. And I hope you see that. Okay, so I hope this has been uh, a blessing to you. Laying on of hands, completely unnecessary, don't need to practice it today, and there is no transfer of authority through the laying on of hands. Not taught in scripture whatsoever. All right, well, thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, comment. Check out the description below, the Telegram feed, you subscribe to that, and alternative channels like Odyssey for backup in case of censorship. Thank you for all the support. God bless you. Have a good day.